Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Blessed are those whose sins are forgiven. Blessed are those whose spirit is able to see. Blessed are those who speak up. Blessed are those who reach out to you in prayer. Blessed are those who hide themselves in you. Blessed are those who hide themselves in you. Because we believe that there is nothing in all of creation that can finally separate us from the love of God, we are free to confess the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone that have become stumbling blocks for us or for others. With the confidence of children of God, let us pray together, first in silence. And now together. More often we live by these words. Toughen up and harden ourselves against all feelings of loss.
Be independent and aggressive, hungry and thirsty for higher status in the social pecking order. We want to live by these words. Soften up and make ourselves tender to grief and loss. We want to be interdependent and gentle, hungry and thirsty for the common good. Refuse to back down or be silent when others misrepresent, threaten, and harm you or others. Remember now the sound of your baptism. Jesus calls us blessed, each and every single one of us. That original blessing, the one that is on our souls and in our hearts, it existed before we even learned how to speak, before we even knew our own names. That is the grace that meets each of us here, each moment of our lives. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. In the spirit of that grace, I invite you now to pass the peace of Christ to one another, respecting each other's COVID comfort levels. May the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Go and do likewise.
Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Michelle and I'm so glad that you're here worshiping with us today. Whether you are online, on Zoom, or here in the sanctuary in person, I am so glad that you have decided to join us here at Brown. If you were in the space, a reminder that masking is optional except while singing, and to stay informed about everything happening at Brown, I encourage you to review the announcements and the prayers found at the back of your bulletin. There will be lunch and education hour following the service today. We are starting our Lenten series on the biblical perspectives of the suffering and death of Jesus. I would also like to make a special announcement as a follow-up to the annual meeting announcement about our dear Rachel Cunningham's upcoming sabbatical. Her sabbatical dates will be from the beginning of June to the end of September. So she will be with us through the spring program year and then take four months of respite. So I wanted to make sure you all knew if you had that question burning in your mind, when, when will we be sending Rachel off into the great unknown of that Sabbath time? And when will she come back to us? So we will do um, other ways to celebrate and honor her time as she leaves and as she returns. And rest assured that there are plans for ways we can support one another and fill in those gaps while Rachel is away. So I wanted to give you that update as early as we were able to. And finally, I'd like to invite the young and the young at heart to come up here and join Pastor Andrew for a special time with the children. All right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. So um, uh, my parents moved recently, and since they save everything and can't throw anything away, they sent me some things, and I found some things that I thought you guys might be interested in. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Um, anybody ever gotten a trophy for anything? A trophy? What did you get a trophy for? For running a mile, I love it. And is the person like running a mile in the thing, on the trophy? No, it's just like a symbol or something? Okay, so these are trophies I got when I was probably around 1982. So that would have been, I would have nine, nine years old. Nine years old, what do you think that one's for? Soccer. I was terrible at soccer, but I did get a trophy. Uh, let's see. And. Here's one. What do you think this one is? I'm going to cover it up for a minute. Snowboarding? <laughs> Good guess. I love it. Swimming, right? Swimming. I was also very terrible at swimming, but um, I was really interested in a person who was on the swim team. So. <laughs> um, this one, and this is an easy one. Tennis. Yeah, I was a little better at tennis than the other things. That was 1986. Okay, so I would have been 13 years old. In that one. So, and then, but I know there are people who don't do sports to be upset if I didn't bring other things. So, here's one for, can you guess what that is? It looks kind of like the military, doesn't it? A little bit. It's like a medal. There's a word on it that I'm covering up so you can't cheat. Just, what's your best guess? What, 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 would, what would you get, like, a medal for? I've never even opened that, actually. Um, It's for band. <laughs> it's a medal for band, right. Band, like when you play an instrument in a band. Yeah, so yeah, so I played the drums. So I was thinking about how um, when you're a kid, you start getting, maybe if not trophies, you start getting like little trinkets and awards for things. Like have you all, like you, who was saying, you were saying earlier, what did you get a, a, a trophy? A medal for running a mile, running a mile. Has anybody gotten any other kind of like something that they got awarded for doing something important or fun yet? Well, you will, trust me. 
you're going to get like certificates and things like this. And once you start getting those certificates, you'll want to get more. You've got you've gotten one, a sailing certificate. What did you get? You got a certificate. So you can earn all kinds of pins and things like that for doing a good job. So I was thinking today about Jesus goes up on the mountain and he tells the disciples about what a good life is all about. And a good life is about um, not being afraid of being sad when sad things happen. A good life is about trying to make peace in a world that always has people who want to fight in it. Uh, a good life is about thinking about your neighbor and others. A good life is about telling the truth. And I was thinking that we don't really give out awards for those things. And that's one of the hard things I think that Jesus is trying to teach us is that um, often we get awards for things like swimming, even like me if you're not good at it, or, or, or soccer, or, or playing in a band. But the real reward is the loving things that we do with and for each other. So even if you don't get a trophy for it, that is the thing that will bring you more joy than you can ever imagine. Um, do you believe that? You do? You do? Tell me why. I'm curious. Well, think about it, because I want to know. Anybody else? Flora? Um, 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 I know you're making some connections. Um, <laughs> well, I hope that, um, when you hear the scripture, because you're going to hear the scripture a lot when you grow up in the church, it's called the Beatitudes. It's all about the ways that we're blessed by doing the things that bring us and other people joy. I hope you will remember that, even, even if you don't get a trophy. All right, let's pray together. And this will, um, you can just um, sit in the uh, silence of this moment. And remember the gift that you are. And remember the love that you have been given. And the love that you have to give. Thank you, God. Amen. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Let us pray. Mother of all wisdom and father of surprise, your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. Where we are closed, open us with your word that we might recognize Christ and follow. Amen. Today's gospel, oh, today's reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. 
Listen now for a word of God. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can the saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under the bushel basket. Rather, they put it on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Creator in heaven. Hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're starting our Lenten sermon series today based on Brian McLaren's We Make This Road by Walking. And McLaren argues that the purpose, the purpose of the Christian faith is to be a movement that is global, spiritual, and social in a quest for what he calls aliveness. The Spirit offers aliveness to the community that is the church amidst powerful forces that want to deaden us to what really matters. McLaren says that aliveness is what most people are after in life, in his experience, but fewer people are seeking it in the church because, he says, religion too often shrinks, starves, cages and freezes aliveness rather than fostering it. I know that many of us wrestle with this contradiction between the spirit that offers life in the way of faith and our frustrations with the Christian religion that sometimes seems to act opposite to Christ's way of loving and living. But McLaren makes the point that what Jesus brought in the Sermon on the Mount on that hillside in Galilee wasn't a make our religion great again nostalgia, nor was it an attempt to create a new age religion. It was a global uprising that began with a focus on a new identity, a reflection about who we are, who we want to be, and what kind of people God knows we can become in the world. Now, according to Jesus today, the people of God already have what we need to live the kind of joyful lives that McLaren is speaking about. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, blessed are, present tense. We are already blessed, not because it is fun to mourn, 
or profitable to be meek or merciful or safe to be peacemakers, but because we have a different frame of reference, the coming kingdom of God, a frame of reference that helps us see more than just loss and war and conflict around us. We have eyes to see God at work in the midst of all the mess in and through and beyond our living. I shared with our session yesterday in our retreat, that's the leadership of our church, some recent writing by Walter Brueggemann, who is known for coining the concept of prophetic imagination. Prophetic imagination, he writes, consists in the capacity to host a world other than the one that is in front of us. Thus, the ancient prophets in Israel lived in a world that was propelled by money, power, wisdom, fear, and violence. But the world to which they bore witness was very different. That world, he writes, given mostly in poetic imagery, is a world where God governs with a will for justice and compassion. In that imagined world to which they bore witness, God has a ready, willing capacity to create joyous, viable conditions for life. Now, recently, Brueggemann was teaching about prophetic imagination, and in a uh, slip of the tongue, instead of saying prophetic imagination, he said instead, pathetic imagination. <laughs> and rather than ignore his slip, he, be he began to play with pathetic imagination as the more dominant idea that is operative in our world. Pathetic imagination, he writes, is the assumption that the world immediately in front of us is the only world on offer. Thus, all possible futures are contained within present observable social reality. This, in effect, means that there are no alternatives to what we have before us. And so no chance for change, no offer of alternative, no possibility of newness. With pathetic imagination, we can see only the world where the poor in spirit are naive suckers, where those who mourn are encouraged to just get over it, where the meek get taken advantage of, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are wasting their time, and the merciful get walked all over. And we all know from experience that this is sometimes true. This is sometimes the way the world works, maybe even more probable than not, when you allow yourself to love and hunger for justice and match cruelty with kindness. The safer way to live is to use our knowledge of these experiences of life and become as self-sufficient as possible, reduce our exposure to potential loss, toughen up our egos and act like we know more than we do, Forget about righteousness and harden our hearts to vulnerability as much as we are able. It's just that, according to Jesus, life isn't very lively in that case. I mean, what you see then is what you get. Fewer surprises, less connection with other people, less purpose in the world, fewer opportunities to come alive. The trouble is that if you live according to Jesus' beatific vision, you are going to get hurt more. You are likely to suffer more. You're probably going to accumulate less wealth than you might otherwise. In some cases, you might even get persecuted. That's the opposite of what some of the prosperity gospel folks preach, I know. And it's not that they are entirely wrong. I mean, when you live like this, Jesus promises, you really come alive. You love more deeply. You have a greater sense of purpose in the world than you ever imagined you might. And as a result, you have a greater capacity to suffer for all the things that matter. 
like cleaning up the planet or doing your part to end all war or resisting white supremacy whenever and wherever it rears its head or practicing kindness when it's obviously getting you nowhere in a particular moment. It's not that you will have less suffering or less struggle. It's that the joy that rises up to match it will be unlike anything you've ever known. I'm afraid that prophetic imagination has been on a bit of a downturn lately. Part of that is no doubt due to the pandemic. I mean, we spent a good year and a half having to face the realities of what we could not do together. How many times did we have to say no to human connection in order to say yes to health and safety. It's not that the no's were a bad idea, it's just that when you get used to that frame of mind for so long, the prophetic imagination muscles atrophy a bit. Add to that our political discourse, which has also been marked by pathetic imagination. Have you seen how many leader, any leaders talking about ending poverty or other moonshot ideas? that require the capacity to host a world other than the one that is before us? The only people authorized to dream those dreams in our culture right now are the super wealthy, a byproduct of our economic systems that have encouraged more and more people to trade in their imagination for what's possible for cash that doesn't always satisfy the way it promises. And that pathetic imagination can't help but seep its way into the church when we let budgets and pointless battles, and we've tried that before thinking, limit the real possibilities that God puts in front of us for coming alive in the adventure that is the gospel. The way out of this kind of small living, according to the gospel, is to get closer to Jesus and to the people who are trying to follow him. Unfortunately, you cannot get one without the other, according to Matthew. Jesus' sermon here is not addressed to individuals. It's addressed to the community that Jesus begins by calling the disciples. Richard Lisher says it this way, Our only hope of living as a community of the Sermon on the Mount is to acknowledge that we do not retaliate, hate, curse, lust, divorce, swear, brag, preen, worry, or backbite because it is not in the nature of our God or our destination that we should be such a people. When we as individuals fail in these instances, as we invariably do, we do not snatch up cheap forgiveness, but we do remember that the ecclesial, the church, is larger than the sum of our individual failures, and that it is pointed in a direction which will carry us away from them. It is pointed in a direction that will carry us away from them. Or as Stanley Hauerwas puts it, no one is asked to go out and try to be poor in spirit or mourn or to be meek. Rather, Jesus is indicating that given the reality of the kingdom, we should not be surprised to find among those who follow him those who are poor in spirit, those who do mourn, those who are meek, Jesus does not suggest that everyone who follows him will possess all of the Beatitudes, but we can be sure that some will be poor, some will mourn, and some will be meek. To be saved, in other words, according to Matthew's Gospel, is to be gathered in the community around Jesus. Now, this could be one of the hardest teachings that Jesus offers to, in a society of people 
who keep trying to get to heaven by expanding the self-help section in our living libraries. I mean, I am really good at being meek or peaceful in the privacy of my own home, away from people who push my buttons. You know who you are. <laughs> and there's always that one person in church who pushes your buttons. But that's where the joy can be found, according to Matthew, among real people. That is real people with real issues who are trying to follow Jesus in a real way. And sometimes, I'd say it's pretty magical, like yesterday in our retreat with the people that you elected back in October to govern our church. One person witnessed to their own experience of God doing new things in our congregation and in their life. Another person testified to the daily meditation practices that were teaching them to stay in their heart and body, not just in their head, bringing more of their full self into their life and calling. We stayed curious and open together about what a more diverse, more connected, more missional congregation attuned more closely to the lives of children and youth in particular, what that would look like and what we would change to lead us closer to there. Once, when one person noted that though the culture of our congregation has tended to poo-poo some musical genres, the experience of them actually singing total praise in the choir had opened their heart and eyes to real joy in a way that had caught them off guard. I looked around and I thought I saw some deep breathing being practiced by a few other elders trying not to slip back into pathetic imagination. You see, practicing prophetic imagination isn't always easy in a world that wants us to go to our corners and prepare to fight. But I'll tell you this, when three o'clock rolled around yesterday, I think I can safely say that everybody in that room felt more alive when, when they, than when they had arrived that morning. And it wasn't because of my coffee brewing skills. It wasn't because of some high-tech facilitator techniques. It was because when Jesus first gathers people together, it is unlike any kind of gathering the world usually sees. People from all kinds of backgrounds and differences you can imagine. Just as he called together those first disciples, so he calls us together and teaches us a new way to deal with wrongdoing by forgiving, a new way to deal with violence through suffering, a new way to deal with money by sharing, a new way to organize our leadership with every member bringing their gifts into the whole, a new way of relationship with larger society and relationships with each other, a new way to be human. And underneath all of our frustrations with the world as we find it, with all the doubts that I know we all bring, with all of our worries about our living or our dying, I sense that most of us do believe that Jesus' way together offers us that opportunity to come alive, that aliveness, that most of us are after.
Jesus calls us the salt of the earth. The gifts we bring forward every day, our time, our skills, our finances, are part of what, of what make us so salty. So keep on bringing that salty, generous self to this place and to the world around us. We cannot be as flavorful without you. You may add your flavor to today by placing cash or check in the offering plate as it comes around, or by using the QR code in your bulletin. Please be generous.
join your hearts in the prayer of dedication with me. Flavorful God, you are full of taste and texture. Your salt brings out the best in each and every one of us. We offer our grains of salt to you this morning that we might better flavor the community with the goodness of your generosity. Amen. You may be seated. We are bringing back the beloved candle lighting during the prayers of the people today. I will introduce our prayer time and then send you off on your way to light candles in either the columbarium or in the prayer labyrinth. Please join your hearts with me as we begin our prayers of the people. Beloved God, we are beginning a season of repentance and healing as we start Lent. We accept your invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others and to imagine the world as it could be together. During this time of prayer, we offer the prayers of our hearts on behalf of God's community and the church and the world. We know that when two or three are gathered, you hear our prayers. We ask that you hear the prayers of our hearts this morning as we say them quietly, as we light candles in honor of those we love and as symbols of faith. Amen. I invite you now to go and light candles. Enjoy this time of meditation and prayer. And then I will um, close this out with the Lord's Prayer when we are all done and everyone's back in their pews.
Please join me now in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ taught us to love and forgive as Christ taught us to forgive and speak out for justice as Christ taught us to speak out for justice. And as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you and between you this day and every day of your gifted life. Mm. 